Hey everybody, it's your girl Bunny. Was this episode amazing or what? It's HBO's original series, Watchmen, starring Regina King. We'll go over season one, episode seven, entitled An Almost Religious Awe. If you haven't watched any of the episodes, if you don't have HBO, no biggie, I got you covered. Make sure to check out and go to the playlist so you can get all caught up and be in this amazing viral sensation that's been hitting the internet in a very intriguing show. For those of you who are new to the channel as well, I recap the entire episode with the pictures to the side offset to give you the visual reminder and also I'll give the review at the end. That's all coming up next. It's Bunny. Throughout this series, at the beginning of every episode, the word watchman evolves visually to give us an idea of what we're about to see and feel. One episode, it was the cracking of eggs. Another episode, it was the evolution of it being smoke. In this episode, the beginning, we see the word watchman appear in this throwback VHS glitchy style. We then hear a narrative voice from the painful oppression of Nazi Germany to the promising New York shores. John Austin, a young boy who had on a hollowed mask that wanted to take it off so he could breathe. One that passed pain, grief, and even death. John Austin was a man who went into an intrinsic field chamber to retrieve his girlfriend's watch and came out a god. Many sought it to be something that would be very toxic and very sad, but many saw it as the world's Superman. He gave so much to the world. He developed things that would help everyone. And then Vietnam. Some saw it as the person who brought the United States its 51st state. Some people saw it as someone who diminished an entire way of living. The video also shows us details of the lithium Timex watch and the lithium battery for vehicles. So it gives us an idea of how impactful Dr. Manhattan was to humanity. Camera pans out and we're able to see that this is a VHS that's playing in a store. And we see a little girl who's observing different VHSs to buy and she sees a Sister Night VHS. And she goes to the counter and she tells the cashier, you know, this is something that I want to buy. And the cashier lets her know, you know, they're not going to let you watch this. Right. And she's just like, Hey, are you going to take my money or what? Because you see the smile and you see that she's so intrigued to get the VHS, not only what it's about, but it looks like she's picking out a VHS that has a cover of someone that looks like her with this scene that we can conclude that this is Angela growing up in Vietnam. As she exits the store with her tape, you can see the ambiance of everyone around her is celebrating Dr. Manhattan. They have toys, they have t-shirts, they have masks. She's walking around, she's noticing everything. And as she's walking, she sees two people that we can assume that are her parents. She then walks up to them, they look at the tape, and they say, well, you know, you have to take this back. And she asked, you know, well, why? Why do I have to take this back? And the parent, the father explains to her that we don't want to learn or know about people in masks. People in masks are very dangerous people. So I need you to take it back. And it's something that I'll go into and I'll explain when you get older. As this young Angela goes back to the store and she's on her, on her way to take back the tape, she notices and she's very observant that there are two gentlemen that are sharing eye contact with one another. They really don't seem like they're mad Matching the positive vibes that are around and one man puts an object in a backpack and they give a wink as if to say you have the okay you have the green light 
And young Angela is just really suspicious and she knows something about this isn't right. She's looking at the two gentlemen. She's looking at the man on the bike. She's looking at everybody else comparing the two. She's looking at her parents off in the distance. She knows that the fluidity, something is wrong and there is a negative energy that she is feeling. As she's standing there, she sees the man on the, on the bike get off with the bicycle and he makes makes an announcement that clearly he wasn't for what happened in Vietnam. It explodes and unfortunately he is by her parents when it happens. Angela is awakened out of this memory that she's having and she looks around and it looks familiar from the last time that she met, met Lady True. And as she's awakened, she's breathing deeply, she's horrified by this memory that she's probably suppressed. And Lady True walks in and she says, well, I see that you're awake. And I know you're probably wondering, how did I get out of that jail cell and arrive here? Well, Agent Blake, she figured since you were ODing on my nostalgia and something that I created, the best solution would for you to be here so we could treat you. And Angela is looking at her in anger, more in shock and saying, what are you putting in my body? What is going on? And she says, well, you know, don't fight it. Try to relax and we'll take care of you. And before Angela can speak, Lady True has put something more in her arms so she can get this nostalgia out of her system. And Angela sees the visual of what appears to be this sort of cortex memory video within her brain. And she hears this, voice of someone very soft speaking and she's seeing a rose and she's seeing this representation and it says so you've taken someone else's nostalgia don't panic we're here to help it seems that your current state and other memories are blocking your cognitive thinking. We call this recognitive um, infection. And what's in your system now is helping to get this nostalgia out of your system so you can slowly get your cognitive thinking back and that all can be an equal balance within your cortex. Angela, she's demanding with Lady True that she sees her grandfather. She wants to talk with him and Lady True says you were just him for the past couple of days, okay? You were just remembering all of his thoughts. It really wouldn't be a good idea for you to talk to him right now. You should really rest. You should let the medicine do its work. And as she's trying to explain everything to Angela, we have Cal that's out in the parking lot asking the cops that are on patrol outside of the building that He's asking for Angela. Where is Angela? Has anybody talked to her? When is she coming out? I need to know. And the cops are telling him, look, you can't get in. You can call. And he said, I've, I've tried to call. I've called over and over again and no one's picking up the phone. I really want to know what's going on. And they tell him, look, she's going in there. She's doing her questions or whatever they're doing. They're trying to help her out. Just relax. Cal doesn't take that as an answer. And he goes to the security booth to say, hey, I've been trying to call and I've been trying to speak with my wife. And she says, okay, that, that's fine. I, I, I have a call, I just got a call. Someone needs to communicate something with you. He steps back and the employee puts this, this little round apparatus on the ground and it's this hologram. And then we see Beyond and she says, well, hello. I know that you're trying to get in contact with Angela, but she can't speak with you right now. She's receiving treatment. And when she's done with her treatment, then you can talk to her. But as of now, you cannot communicate with your wife. And as, as quickly as the hologram arrives, it disappears. Agent Blake is in the car listening to footage that she recorded as Angela had all of her visions under this nostalgia. And she's hearing Angela ramble, saying all these different things. Beware of the Cyclops. I've joined the enemy. The enemy is suppressing our people. She's hearing the rambles of Cyclops is using things to mesmerize people. You can hang yourself now. She's listening to all of these things that she's recorded on tape because Angela was in her state and probably doesn't know that she was saying all of those things out loud. 
Petey calls Agent Blake and he says, hey, do you remember when you told me to keep an eye on Wade? Because you thought it was really weird how he ratted out Angela and he might be with 7th Calvary. And Blake is like, uh, yeah, I remember I told you that. Those, ca that those words came out of my mouth and I told it to you not that long ago. So what are you talking about? And he says, well, I don't think that estimate is right because I'm here at Looking Glass's place and 7th Calvary is here on the, on the ground dead. So I don't think that's something that we have to concern ourselves with. But I do think it's a little strange that even if something happened, he didn't ask for backup. He didn't call the precinct. So we really need to talk and we really need to get this underway. And she says, okay, well, yes, we definitely will go over that, but you don't call for backup and I'll explain it to you later. But in the meantime, I have some things that I need to go over. You just stay there. And she hangs up Petey. Agent Blake goes to see Mrs. Crawford. And when she arrives, she's riding her horse and she has on a hat which has the Cyclops symbol on the front. And she asks to speak with her. She says, Mrs. Crawford, there are a few things that I would like to talk to you about. And they may seem a little strange, but I just need to go over my notes. It appears that Angela, she was under this nostalgia. And I, I think I know who killed your husband. Her grandfather killed your husband. And from the things that she was mumbling, it would appear that your husband was involved with Cyclops. And Mrs. Crawford, she says, okay, well, what, what is that supposed to mean to me? She says, well, throughout everything, he has this idea that he did a good thing in killing Judd. And this Cyclops was a white supremacy organization. But instead of it being the Cyclops organization now, we have the Seven Calvary, still the same beliefs, still the same things that they're doing. It's just the name that has changed. And does that sound familiar to you? It's this, it's this idea that the Senator can use this as a cover up to kill lots of people and kill cops. And with the effect of that, now the cops are covering their faces. And now you have the Seventh Calvary covering their faces. And now we don't know who the good guys are and the bad guys are. And without any space, Mrs. Crawford says, wow, you know, we didn't think that you would figure that out, but yeah, when we started to do these certain things, we realized presidency and taking control, that was kind of small potatoes. And Agent Blake gives this look like, what? Because she didn't think that she would fess up to everything that she's concluded so far. She says, well, I see that I'm gonna have to take control of the situation. And she goes to use this remote that's using the same type of mesmerizing light technology, but instead it doesn't work. It has something wrong with it. And Agent Blake is just so stunned that she can't get out of her seat. And instead, Mrs. Crawford, she pushes another button and the floor collapses under Agent Blake instead, knocking her out. And Mrs. Crawford gets on the phone and says, hey, you know that Agent Blake? Yeah, she figured it out. I mean, what do you want, to, want me to do? You want me to kill her or what? Angela is awakened again in her bed, still receiving her treatment, only to see Bian at the end of her bedside. And Bian has a series of different pictures that she's showing her. One picture has one image and another picture has another. And she says, in these two photos, who looks more kind? And Angela answers and says, well, this person. She shows a different series of photos and said, which person is afraid? Which person is sad? Which person is angry? And she's asking her all of these questions. And Angela said, you know what? I'm sorry, but what does this have to do with my treatment? And Beyon says, oh, well, it has nothing to do with your treatment at all. I'm actually working on my dissertation. And with these photos, it's helping me understand how the world sees racial suppression and racial cohesion, how they're empathetic to different images that they see. And Angela says, that's really weird because I have a son your age and I can't even get him to open a book and you're doing a dissertation. And Bian says, you know, hmm, when I wake up, I hurt from what I've seen. 
when you had your memories, how did you feel? And Angela says, I hurt. The things that I saw, I could feel it. Bian says, hmm, that's interesting. What do you tell your children? Why do you lie to them? And Angela says, excuse me? She says, why don't you tell your children that you're a cop? And Angela goes on to explain that I do that because I feel that I'm, I'm protecting them. I'm protecting them from that information and I don't want them to be worried. And Beyon makes a point in saying, if you're a cop, what's the point of being a cop if you don't tell anybody that you're a cop? Angela, she's in school and we can think maybe this is an orphanage or some type of childcare since her parents have been deceased with the bomber. And the lead of the orphanage gets her out and says, these cops, they want to talk to you. They have a few questions that they want to ask you. And she goes outside and there are two cops and they say, well, hello, are you Angela? And she tells them that, yes, I'm Angela. And she says, don't be afraid. We just want to ask you some questions about what you saw with the bomber. And she tells them, well, yeah, I saw it and, and it all happened. And they said, okay, we want you to be able to identify the person. And they show her the gentleman in the back of the squad car. And Angela says, I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid at all. And that was him. They then get the gentleman out of the car, they cover his head, and they begin to walk off, letting us know that they're about to ex execute the guy. And Angela turns to the female cop and says, can I watch? And it intrigues the cop into thinking that, wow, here it is, a child that saw her parents murdered by a bomber, and she's asking, can she see the execution of the person who helped do it? And the cop says, when you get older, you contact me. And she hands her a badge, letting her know that you're clearly different from any other child. She hears the shot and we see this satisfaction come over this young Angela as if she has peace in knowing that this person has been, per has been executed. Instead of following directions, you know, Angela, she is so determined to figure out where she is, where Will is, just putting two and two together. She gets out of her room and realizes that the only way to get into this room where she thinks Will is being held, she needs Grant access of fingerprint and the print of her hand. But but before she can get to that, she sees Lady True and Lady True invites her to have lunch. And when they sit down, Lady True says, you know, I know that there's a lot of weird stuff that's going on, but there's something that I want to run by you. Throughout everything that you've experienced, you know, Cal, the way you met him, don't you think it's strange that when you met, he had this car accident and he doesn't remember anything of his life before that. I find that to be intriguing. And in this day and age, that's highly unlikely that he has no recollect recollection and no thoughts of his entire life before this wreck. And Angela is insulted and says, there's nothing that you know about my husband. You just met me and even Will, he knows nothing about me or my family. So you might wanna watch it and ask me all these questions questions. And since we're talking about memories and we're talking about things, what nostalgia and what thoughts are you putting into your daughter? And we can see the anger from Lady True trying to be compressed. And she says, excuse me, what? And Angela says, what memories, what nostalgia are you giving your daughter? She says that she has visions and dreams. And when she awakens, she hurts. And Lady True says, well, that's not my daughter. That's actually my mother. And Angela says, what? <laughs> and Lady True says, that's not my daughter. It's actually my mother. You see, before my mother died, I wanted to make sure that I extracted her thoughts and I cloned her. So what you're seeing is a clone of my mother. And I wanna make sure that my mother has all of those thoughts and everything that she's experienced. So I'm feeding them to her slowly. I'm feeding her memories to her at a rate in which she can slowly stand. And Angela says, okay, well tell me what's this machine you're building out here? What does it do? Aren't you gonna tell me what it does? And Lady True looks deeply into her eyes and says, no.
We see that Agent Blake, she has been captured. She's tied down to a chair. We see the Cyclops symbol on the back wall and she's looking around in just pure amazement of what she's seeing. She's just so drained and fed up with everything around her. You can see her energy as she slumps into her chair. Like, I can't even believe I'm seeing this. She sees people all around her. They're working diligently on things and they're, they're, they're grinding things down and they're building apparatuses. They have the Rorschach mask on. And the, then she sees the Senator walk up to her with just so much confidence. And she says, let me guess, you are going to tell me your stupid plan. And I don't even want to know your stupid plan. I don't want to know what you're doing. I'm tired and I don't care what you're trying to do. Let me guess, you were a young boy and your grandfather sat you on his knee to let you know that you're part of this Cyclops legacy and that you're racist. And he says, no, 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 that's, that's not what we're doing here. I won't tell you my plan. What's going on is that you feel that you're not important with what's going on, but you are important. You are going to be something to help us because, you know, it's really hard to be a white man in America. It's just so difficult. And Agent Blake is giving him that look like, are you serious? And she's huffing and puffing, listening to his entire speech. And he says, you know, it's so hard to be a white man in America that we're going to try to be blue. And Agent Blake gives him this look like, what are you about to do? Angela is in this room and she's looking at a video of Lady True speaking to a crowd saying all of her accolades, how she went to MIT and then she bought it, how she's engineered so many things, how she's successful. But unfortunately, the negative of all of that was what she invented with nostalgia and how people started to OD on it. And it was because they had that those memories that they craved so much and people were so so deeply involved with capturing things of the past instead of living in the now, instead of living in the future. So as a turnaround of that, she starts to explain that this millennium clock is a step towards the future, is the step towards people moving on and living for the future and living of the hopes of things turning around. Angela is so overwhelmed and fed up. She's yelling and screaming, what do you want from me? What is going on? On. And she runs down to the room where she suspect, suspects Will to be confined and where he's being held and the other person that's attached to her treatment. And she breaks the access entry code to get into the room. When she gets into the room, instead of seeing Will, she actually sees this elephant that's receiving this treatment, which gives her even more confusion, more just uh, anger and trying to figure out what's going on. Where is Will? Why is she connected with an elephant? And why is it showing that this elephant is receiving cognitive memories and thoughts and it's viewed on the screen? So Angela is just bubbling with sadness, confusion, and anger of what's going on and why she's connected and why she's being con controlled per se and remembering things as a child that she tried to suppress as an adult woman for so long. Meanwhile, Adrian, he is preparing for court because he has tried to leave his prisoner-esque world. And we see that there are all these clones. Some are in the jury area, some are in the audience. We even have some that are off to the side. We have clones that are on the prosecution side. And one of them makes the announcement to all rise as the game warden enters and takes his seat as the judge. We then have a female clone that stands up and she is the prosecutor and she's making her argument that remember that 
Thou shall not leave. Here we have Adrian Veidt who has tried to leave. He is guilty, guilty of taking several of us, doing experiments on us, all for the sake of trying to escape. Let me remind the court also that he is guilty, guilty, guilty in killing millions of people for the sake of him engineering something in which he thought would save humanity. He is guilty, guilty, guilty. Remember, thou shall not leave. And then we see the game warden as the judge talk to the defense and saying, Adrian, you have chosen once again in your movements to try to escape that you would like to defend yourself. Do you have any closing words that you would like to say? And Adrian stands up, looks at everyone and lets out one of the longest farts I've heard in a while. <laughs> and he says, hmm, um, the defense rests. <laughs> And he had nothing else to say about that. And the game warden didn't find it too, too pleasing. He didn't find anything sensational about it. And he says, you know, since this jury has a hard time trying to make a decision, I called some reinforced judges and some reinforced jurors to come in and make the decision. They open the door and it's this flood of little piglets that comes in and he picks up one of the piglets and he says, what do ye say ye? And the pill starts to squeak, 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 squeak. And the, and the game warden says, guilty. And all of the clones start to say after one another, guilty, guilty, guilty. And Adrian is sitting there in tears because he knows that he is not getting out of this prison anytime soon. Angela has another childhood memory and she's remembering when she was sitting down in the orphanage doing arts and crafts and the lady of the orphanage demands her to speak with this woman. Someone is trying to talk to you and this is, you know, and the older black lady says, you let her talk to you like that all the time? <laughs> and young Angela says, you know, nothing and looks to her because she's trying to be respectful. But the older black woman goes on to explain to her that, hi, my name is June and I'm your grandmother and I'm here to take you home. And we feel this relief of, wow, you know, Angela's finally gonna get some sort of sanity and knowing home and knowing her roots and who she is. And we see this grandmother and young Angela at this food cafe and they're eating food and they're drinking a little soda. And June goes on to say, I'm your grandmother. And you know, my son, you know, we didn't, it was a lot that we didn't get along on and we just, as he grew older, we divided and just things didn't go on and he went on to fight and I wanted to send him letters and it was this one time where I sent him a letter and it came back to me and on the envelope it read deceased and I did my research and I found out that he was married and not only was he married, he had a child. So with that, here I am and I found you and I'm here to take you back home. And Angela says, well, you know, well, where are we going? Where is home? And she says, well, Tulsa and Tulsa, Oklahoma. That is where you're from. That is where your roots are. And she says, you know, enough about me. What are some things that you have? What are some things that can tell me a little bit about Angela? And Angela pulls out the, <laughs> the tape that she picked out that she's so excited about. And she says, oh yeah, the sister night. This, I remember this movie. You'll love it. When we get back home, I have a VHS player and we can look at it. What else do you have? And then she pulls out a Saigon badge, a police badge. And she says, well, I'm going to be a police officer. And her grandmother says, yes, of course you are. Because she's reflecting back at her husband. She's reflecting back at her situations. And she says, well, why haven't you looked at this tape yet? And she lets her know that her father informed her that we shouldn't trust people who are in masks. They don't do anything right. And we should be afraid of them. We should be afraid of masks. And she says, your father said that because someone who wore a mask hurt him. But when we get back home, we'll make sure to watch it. And as they have their little talk, they head out, they slowly make their way to the car, to the vehicle, and the grandma makes her way to the back of the car to pack Angela's suitcase into the trunk. 
And as she's doing that, we see her collapse and she passes away. And there's not even this fear or scream, cry or any type of emotion. Angela is just standing there accepting that something else in her life has been taken away. And she just stares at her grandmother on the ground. And unfortunately, she's lost another family member. She's lost her grandmother. Angela is still trying to find her way throughout this building to escape, to get out. And she comes across a room that has this blue sphere right in the middle of it. And as she gets closer to it, she's starting to see these images and hologram videos of people that are in this telephone booth thinking that they're calling and they're leaving messages for Dr. Manhattan. And then she runs across this area on the globe that shows all the different parts of the world. And she's touching on several different locations on this globe and hearing all of these different voices. She then sees Tulsa, Oklahoma and presses the Tulsa, Oklahoma in area on the globe. And when she presses it, she sees Agent Blake and Agent Blake is reciting what we heard a few episodes back saying, I don't know why I keep talking to you. I don't know why I'm telling you all of this. I don't know why I'm telling you jokes. You don't even understand jokes. So we know that what she was saying was being heard somewhere. And Lady True walks in and she tells Angela, wow, I developed that device and it's just so amazing how many people go into these booths just saying all of these prayers, this hope like Dr. Manhattan will help them. And it's just sad because they really think that he's listening. But the truth is that he's not. He's not even on Mars. He's actually in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and he's been living as a human. And Angela says, you know, what What are you talking about? What's going on? And Lady True says, no, when are we going to stop BSing around? And when are we actually going to communicate and talk with each other? When will you look around and start to see the truth? And Angela says, you know, I don't know what's going on. And Lady True cuts her off. She says, look, in less than one hour, 7th Calvary, okay, they're going to capture him. And their idea is that if they have this power, they will control everything. Do you realize how dangerous that is if 7th Calvary captures him, takes Dr. Manhattan and has this power? Do you realize what will happen? We can't let that happen. Lady True also makes an observation and saying, wow, Angela, with everything that I just told you, what's interesting is that you didn't ask me who he was. And Angela says, well, what do you mean? She says, I told you that he's living in Tulsa, Oklahoma as a human, and you didn't ask me who he was. Why didn't you ask me? And Angela doesn't say anything. Angela is overwhelmed and she makes her way out of the building. She finds a way to get out. And when she gets to that parking lot, she gets in a vehicle and she sees the cops blocking her way to get out. And she's telling one officer, look, let him know that he needs to move because I don't want to hurt him. And the other cop nonchalantly says, hey, you need to move your car because Angela says that she doesn't want to hurt you. And he's just like, forget it. She's not getting out of here. Angela pumps on that gas, barges through, knocks his car, like knocks the mess out of it, continues to go on. She has pedal to the metal, okay? She goes and makes her way back home. And as she goes back home, we see that Seven Calvary and a few members with the Rorschach mask, they're in a truck across the street street watching her go into her home. She goes into her house, she sees Cal, and we see her roughaging in the kitchen. And Cal says, Angela, is that you? She says, yeah, it's me. And she's looking for something. He says, well, I tried to get a hold of you, but they wouldn't let me in. I called several times. And she says, you know what? What happened before the accident? You're not yourself. He says, well, what are, you, what are you talking about? She says, you, you're not yourself. And she has a hammer in her hand. And Cal says, you know what? You're not yourself. You've been in treatment. You don't know what you're saying. Put, put it down so we can talk. And she says, you know what? What happened after the accident? 
And Cal says, you're not yourself. You need to put that down. I want to know so we can talk. And Angela says, no, you're not yourself. And proceeds to bash Cal's head in into oblivion, okay? Into oblivion until she goes into an area of his forehead and she goes and she picks out something and she notices this round device. And it is that Manhattan symbol that we've been seeing throughout this series. And it has a blue hue to it, letting us know that somehow, some way, Dr. Manhattan has been working through Cal this entire time. And that is the end of the episode. This show has done an amazing job with wonderful twists and turns. Like I've said throughout of all of these reviews and recaps, beautiful cinematography, awesome writing. A lot of people didn't give this show a chance because of the director who did Lost and people had in their mind, look, I remember the circles that I did while watching Lost. I'm not about to go through this with this show at all, but I could tell from the writing, I could tell of the fluidity of the show. That was not what we were in for. I could tell that this was going to be something to give some time and to give a chance. They've done, again, an amazing job with shockers without being cheesy, without being boring. It makes the audience think. It doesn't dump all of the information on us at once. We are pulled in every single episode wondering what is going to happen next. What character will be revealed to us next? Are they the patriarchs? Are they the villains? Are they someone that we need to keep keep an eye out on? Are they really themselves? And this was an amazing twist to the story. Now we did suspect a lot of the comments said and thought that something is not up with Cal. I even thought that he was working with Seven Calvary. I thought for the longest time something's not right with that husband. There's something about that husband. We had a niche for it. We knew it was something. We knew it was something up with Cal. Now we know what's up with Cal. <laughs> now we know the situation. But what is Dr. Manhattan trying to do? The shocker of knowing he's not even on Mars. The fact that he has been incognito. I was about to say incognito. <laughs> the fact that he has been hidden amongst the masses the entire time. Lady True, what are her plans? Is this a team idea? Where is Will? Why was Angela hooked up to an elephant? Were they just using that to harbor a brain and to harbor thoughts? I just love how they're pulling us in. Since Game of Thrones, there aren't too many shows on TV that allow us to be intrigued and are very deep thought provoking scripts. But this show is absolutely amazing. It's good to see because you don't even have to have read the comic books necessarily or the movie to understand what's going on. Since this is an interpretation of the what if, since it takes place 30 plus years after the comic books end. So I really, really love this. I love the fact that I can watch something and have my mouth open like, oh, did that really just happen? Oh my God, did that really just happen to this character? What's gonna happen with Adrian? We are on episode seven. We only have two more episodes left, right? And I know there's been rumors going around that this is gonna be a short series. It's only gonna be one season, um, that there won't be a season two. I don't know how they're gonna wrap that up in just two more episodes. I don't know, that really wouldn't make sense. Um, but I don't doubt the writing. If they're able to sum that up in two more episodes, okay, great. But this is a lot of revenue, it's HBO. Oh, what to just do in what one season? I mean, it's been done with short series before. We've seen it with Chernobyl. We've seen it with several others on HBO that have been one season um, or they've just been two. Uh, but I really think that there's going to be a season two. And if there's a season two, I can see that being the end of the series if it is short. I'm just in awe of this wonderful series, the amazing acting, like... If they get an Emmy for this, I won't be shocked because it's ideas that are being executed well. There are several series that come out and the idea is absolutely wonderful, but the script, the writing, the direction, 
isn't executed well. In this instance, both dynamics and both di relationships, the cinematography, the acting, and the script go hand in hand. Everything is just skipping into the sunset, just so amazing. And I'm just, just loving it. I'm loving every single moment. The entire time I'm trying to memorize notes and memorize things as I'm watching it and, 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 and thinking at the same time. So it's a lot. Let me know what you think. Do you like it? Um, are you on the bad bandwagon? Did you hear about the show after it started and you said, well, I need to start watching this. I need to start watching some reviews um, because you did think a certain way at the beginning. Kudos to everybody who was patient with this show and allowed it to grow and allowed it to develop because it's not easy investing your time and investing your energy in a show that's whack because we've all been there and done that. Kudos to everybody in this series. The visuals are absolutely stunning. I mean, this is cinematic perfection for it to be a series. Um, subscribe. Let me know what you think. I don't know if you noticed, I subscribe to whomever subscribes to me. And follow me on Instagram at the same profile name, officialbun underscore E. Another side note, I know a lot of you were saying that you wanted the volume to increase and to become better. I hope that you do notice that the sound has improved. I've made sure that I've gotten the, the correct microphone devices so you can enjoy these reviews and recaps much clearer, more vivid, and yeah, I hope that you like it. Thank you for staying patient with me as a new U YouTuber. I actually looked back at my first video and I was like, wow, it's only been almost four months. I can't, can't believe it. So if I'm learning and growing in just four months, I can't wait to see how this channel progresses and grows in a year. So spread the word, let everybody know about the other playlists and other shows that I'm reviewing. Catch up, take your time, binge watch, binge watch a lot of the things that are on the playlist. Check out Handmaid's Tale, check out Pose, check out Wu-Tang and American Saga, check out all of these awesome shows, Greenleaf. Iyana Van Zandt, Fixed My Life, all of these shows that you can have fun listening to. Spread the word. Please tell everybody to subscribe and I'll subscribe back. I really want this show to develop and grow as I review more shows. Love you guys. Talk to you later. Don't forget to comment. I respond to everybody, whether it's positive or negative. I hope you guys have a wonderful week. I hope you had a wonderful Thanksgiving holiday and see you next time. Bye.